our fire system is perfect. It's just that there's this one bad operator. And if we find all the bad operators and get them out, then it's going to work fine. This is the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center podcast. I'm Alex Victora, Assistant Center Director of the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center here in sunny Tucson, Arizona. That was Travis Dotson, Lessons Learned Center analyst, describing what we're going to chat with you about today. Bad apples. No, this isn't a discussion about fruits and vegetables. It's a discussion about how we sometimes make sense of bad outcomes. Stay tuned. The term bad apples is part of an old proverb. One bad apple spoils the bunch. The meaning here is simple. One bad fruit can ruin a bunch of fruit. For our purposes, the meaning of the term bad apple has changed over the years and separated itself from this old metaphor about fruit. In the world of safety and risk management, we look to Sidney Decker's definition and use of the term in his book, The Field Guide to Human Error. In it, Decker lays out a simple premise. Folks who do work in any particular job might assume that the rules and regulations that govern the work are well-designed, maybe even perfect. According to the bad apple theory of safety, when bad things happen, accidents and tragedies, it's due to the bad apples involved in the event. And it's presumed that these bad apples are somehow different from the others working in the system, from the rest of us. According to the bad apple theory, the problem begins and ends with these bad apples. The rules, regulations, and cultural norms that govern what real work looks like? Nothing to see here, folks. Let's get to it now with Travis Dotson. Sorry, folks, you got me again, but you get Britt. Yep, I'm Britt, uh, Britt Rosso. I'm the director of Lesson Learned Center. Why are we talking about bad apples today? Um, because we deal with bad outcomes. A lot of Lessons Learned Center stuff deals with um, bad outcomes and then trying to extract lessons. Mm. One of the things that we, or what we've discovered is that it's harder for people to learn when they use a version of the bad apple theory, basically, mm. well, yeah, the, they got hurt falling that tree, but it's because they're a bad sawyer or yeah, they were overrun by fire, but it's because they're not a good engine captain. That perspective, what that does is it lets the person off the hook, the person that didn't go through it with it, you know, they yeah. can read the report and say, oh, well, here's, they made this mistake and this mistake and this mistake, and I would never make those mistakes. Therefore, I'm okay. They're a bad firefighter. End of lesson. It's not really a lesson. They're, they, they haven't really learned anything. And that's why I think we hit this so hard yeah. is because it gets in the way of learning. Absolutely. So question, why do we, when we look at accident incident reports, look for the mistakes that were made? Why do we consciously do that? What, rather than looking for the potential lessons that can make us better at what we do? Why do we, is that just normal human being behavior? We're just doing what we saw other people do. Yeah, uh, sure. We're just, it's just, we just mimic. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and somehow it makes us feel safe. But I think to, to me, the, the, re, the real reason for bad apples, that, that whole discussion, is it, if you get too comfortable with that concept, it starts to be unconscious and you really start to limit your, your capacity to learn from those around you because you just start putting people in categories. Bam, bam, bam. And, and hearing about somebody that you have no connection to that was involved in a bad outcome like an entrapment or a vehicle accident or an escape prescribed fire. It's just so easy to just go, well, based on the outcome, bad apple. And if you're, if you're thinking that way, then when you get the report or you hear the stories, you're looking for the, the reasons to confirm, you know, you're just, you're already looking for it. Confirmation so, bias. Yeah. And so then you find it because you're looking for it. Yep. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What was that? Confirmation bias. Confirm it, yeah. Confirmation bias? What is confirmation bias? Here's one definition. The tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. Whether we know it or not, confirmation bias is one of the many biases that are likely at play when we talk about bad apples. 
Being aware of these types of biases is part of the battle, especially if you're trying to guard against the trap that is bad apples. Let's get back to Travis and Britt now and a handy metaphor that we've referenced before on the podcast, clocks and clouds. Again, real basic clocks and clouds theory is um, famous dead guy, Karl Popper, philosopher, scientist, all this stuff. And he, at one point, divided the world into clocks and clouds. Clocks, you can break down, you can literally envision a diagram of a clock and broken down into all its parts. Clock's not working right. You find the tooth that was rounded mm-hmm. or the um, whatever, the piece that wasn't working right. You fix that one piece, the clock works right again. That's right. the bad apple theory. Right. Uh, the, the clouds, on the other hand, are you look at a diagram of how a cloud was formed and it's like, oh, there was a mountain range and then there was a stream and then this little pulse of mo- moisture came through and there was solar radiation and, the, you know, the cloud <laughs> built up. But then there was this front that stacked it up and, you know, all of these things make a cloud and you can't really say um, w- which piece caused the cloud. Right. It's the combination. So you can only describe the whole system. Like um, conditions, the conditions, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the 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 bad apple theory is the clock mode, which I'm not saying there's not clocks. Of course, there's clocks. If the if if the Mark III doesn't start, it's gotta, a clock. Got to figure out what's what's broken. What's yeah, wrong. but humans aren't Mark Threes, and a collection of humans certainly aren't Mark Threes. <laughs> you know, but the 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 um, clock is saying no. The whole system works. There's just a bad part. Right. And that's what bad apples is. Yeah. The, the, our fire system is perfect. It's just that there's this one bad operator. And if we find all the bad operators and get them out, then it's going to work fine. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the, the way I want to approach this is through prescribed fire. Okay. What were you doing in May of 2000? May of 2000, I was uh, a hotshot suit. So it was probably had a bunch of young kids at the hotshot camp, and we were starting to build our build our crew for the year. And you were working for the Park Service. I was working for the National Park Service. Yep, in California. So you remember getting the news? Yeah, I remember exactly where I was. When I got the news. I was on our first day off. We had finished our first week, and I got a call from a kid that used to work for me, very animated, and said, "We didn't do it. We didn't do it." Wow. And I had no idea. What he was talking about, other than he was on some little burn somewhere in Region 3, and it wasn't going well. And the next morning at breakfast uh, with my crew after PT, we're sitting there watching the TV, and I looked up from my my eggs, and all I could see on CNN was headlights and a ton of um, Los Alamos being evacuated with a big, huge header in the background, and figured Mm -hmm. that's the one he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I was, I was probably about as, as, as exact opposite of your position. I was, you were running the hotshot crew. I was a seasonal on a hotshot crew. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what eventually happens for those that weren't around and didn't know that the fire goes over the hill, literally goes down into the community of Los Alamos and wipes out neighborhoods. Uh, almost 240 homes. Yeah. Um, just destruction and it threatens a national laboratory and that national laboratory is famous for its nuclear program yep nuclear yep yeah so big deal big bad deal um 18,000 people evacuated yep. you know um yeah just <sighs> like center of all media yeah for those that weren't around fighting fire in 2000 it was yeah, that's all anybody could talk about. There was a moratorium on burning. Yep. That wow. stopped us. Our, I can't remember if it was all agencies or just the Park Service, but we, yeah, we, we stopped prescribed burning for quite a while. Yeah. Had to go through. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine an event this t- at today. today that would just go like, all right, stop burning. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that were just like, oh, man, who were those knuckleheads? Sure. Who was it that lit it? Like, Besides, not... Not who was it, the Park Service. No, who individually. So that's interesting because initially, right off the bat, it, the, the bad apple was an agency. Yeah, right? yeah. So we made, we made uh, many folks made the agency the bad apple. And now we want to drill a little deeper. Okay, well, who inside? Yeah, what individuals? Right. 
Um, so the original Burn Boss transition, crazy timing, a crew that, that that had to go down the hill on its unexpectedly. So and then they couldn't get the contingency resources, all those kinds of things, which you can go and read about. The eventual Type Three IC said, "Hey, let me take this as the Burn Boss." And so they made him the Burn Boss, and he eventually made the recommendation. Um, based on the fact that they weren't catching this one slop and they needed some resources. And so he said, yeah, I think we need to convert it. They all had a little chat. They converted it. That uh, that individual um, took over as IC3 and um, right away had to make a decision about going direct or indirect, made a decision, went with it, <clears throat> still went over the hill. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, yeah, here's the big payoff. Who was the Type 3 IC at Cerro Grande? It was Paul Gleason. Paul Gleason. Why do we know that name? Why do we know Paul Gleason? <laughs> do you remember hearing that Paul Gleason was there? Eventually. It, it, it was quite a while because, because it was a busy fire season. And yeah. Initially, it was I, or what I remember from 18 years ago was I heard he was there. It's like, wow, he was there. And then as you hear a little bit more, it's like, well, he wasn't only there. Yeah. He ended up uh, transitioning as the burn boss and then... Uh, becoming the Type 3 IC uh, when they converted it until the team arrived and, and managed the incident. And then you get a little another piece and a little another piece of info. One of the last descriptors I would ever use for Paul Gleason would be Bad Apple. <laughs> well, that's the whole point of this chat, right? It's just like, it kind of, for me, it, 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 shot my, it shot my theory. Like just right then and there. I mean, I went on to use the bad apple theory and I still do. I catch myself with it. But at the time, I remember, I literally remember when I heard it, I literally was like, like another dude named Paul Gleason. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it can't be the one we know. Yeah. It's not, 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 not the LCES guy. No. Can't be know. that guy. Not the guy that was on the loot fire. Not, no. Not the same guy that was on the dude fire. No, no. Not that Paul Gleason. No. Yeah. Because, I mean... Not the father of Elsie, yes. No, no, yeah. It's, it must be some. It's kind of a, com- a common name, right? Right. Um, yeah, and um, and, and then eventually, um, doing that staff ride, I got to see, I got to witness a lot of people struggling with that same thing. Because mm-hmm. um, we used to do the staff ride twice a year, and there was a lot of a uh, uh, talk about the the failings of of the decision makers mm-hmm. and um, especially w- w- if we let it go that far, um, this decision about direct or indirect by the IC3, uh, which was outside of the scope of what we were talking about, but it was so juicy that people would want to go there yeah. and it'd just be like, it's those damn parkies wanting to finish their burn. Right. That's why they, you know, rather than cut it off, take it to the road. Yeah. Why would, why did they want to bring it down the sides and you know, the line that was already there for their prescribed fire, even though they had just converted it, why did they use that rather than, hey, man, this cat's out of the bag. Let's go direct and pick this thing up um, super small. That's the the right thing to do mm. is the way it was viewed. And people would get pretty animated about it. Mm. And then you drop the bomb. <laughs> so you think that Type 3 IC screwed up? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's Paul Gleason. You're saying that uh, you know, Paul Gleason made this enormous tactical error, and it was the same thing. Kind of like, like, like the Paul Gleason, <laughs> 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 which as a, you know, instructor, it was always great, you yeah. know, to, to have that wow. that moment. But, um, but Paul yeah. Paul had correct if I'm wrong. I haven't had the opportunity to be on on the staff right there. But Paul had two. One for sure, maybe two Forest Service shot crews there by that time when they were just yeah. kind of, when yeah. they were going to decide whether to uh, go under slung. Yeah, off or, yeah. Um, and there was some consultation with those soups, if I remember right. For sure. I mean, Santa Fe was already up on the hill, and um, and you talk to other people there, and they're just like, <laughs> going direct wasn't an option. Yeah. You know, that just it, and and you know, and I think about it. It, it did involve underslung, and we have a video that, that, that where Paul Gleason talks about his decision. Well, he talks about the whole thing, but specifically about that decision. And he, he says, yeah, we were worried about the perception that we were just trying to finish the burn. Um, and he tells this super personal story about um, a previous fire and, uh, and one of his squad bosses getting smacked by a tree uh, doing underslung line. And, and he had always just 
had a bad taste in his mouth, yeah. you know, and who likes underslung line anyway? You yeah. know what I mean? Like who, who says, yeah, underslung, you know, <laughs> um, it's just, um, especially in timber. Yeah. Especially in timber. It's, it's just a pain in the ass. Pain in the ass and a low probability of success. Um, and there's already line in. Right. Like who doesn't go with line that's already in? Straight line down to the road, let fill it in. Yeah. Done. Um, and so, yeah, tactically, it doesn't take long to get to a place where it's like, okay, I can, I can see that. Um, you know, and, and, of course, nobody there thought about the, even the possibility of, oh, this, if, if we don't catch this, it's going to burn down over the hill, downhill, run into, you know, out on these mesas and into Los Alamos. Right. Like, it just, right. it, it just doesn't even no. really make sense. Um, but it did it. Um, and so anyway, the whole point of this is, is that here's this, this fire legend and, and he was, he was the one, he was the, that traditionally that's where we would target a lot of the, the, the bad apple. Mm. And for me at the time, the only reason I couldn't do that was because it was Paul Gleason. He was the pinnacle of his game, you know, the pinnacle of his career. Um, from all the things he had experienced, done, done for us, done for the fire service. Student of fire. Where do we get that term? Yeah. Um, yeah. Student of fire. Student, <laughs> the term student of fire. Like Paul Gleason. <laughs> Paul Gleason. Imagine that, you know. So are we saying it's easier to put the label of bad apple on some people and harder to put the label on others just by who they are and what they've done? Okay. That's a great question. When you're close when you know the person, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's harder to apply the bad apple theory for the same reasons. Like I had this enormous respect for Paul Gleason. And I'd never met him. Yeah. It was just, he was just somebody that you respect mm -hmm. because he's super badass in all the ways that we chart badassery <laughs> in the fire service. <laughs> but anyway, it's just, it, and, and the same thing happens when it's somebody, you know, personally, yeah. and then they're in the bad thing. Um, and I think we've each had some experiences with that, um, mm -hmm. where especially when you start seeing other people uh, use the bad apple theory and directing it at people that you know yeah. and you have worked with and you don't share that opinion of if you say, no, man, they they were solid. They were a super solid operator. You don't understand. And I mean, it gets to like fighting words, kind of like yep. I get super <clears throat> defensive when when people are throwing rocks at my bros that happened to be in some situation that, that didn't turn out well, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard because it feels personal. Yep. Because you know them. It is personal. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll go direct with you. Like at you, you had somebody at South Canyon, right? Mm hmm. Yep. Roger Roth. Did, did you have that experience? Did you, you know, was it harder to, to write it off as just, Bad firefighters? Oh, absolutely. Roger Roth, a friend of mine, worked with me in 1989 on, on the Hotshot crew. Uh, moved on, wanted to become a jumper. Um, eventually got picked up at uh, a call, and just by luck of the jump list and happenstance, ended up at South Canyon on July 6th and down in the hole instead of up on the ridge. And uh, we lost him there with 13 other firefighters that day. And I can remember back then, you know, first hearing about the incident and then eventually a couple of days later finding out that Roger was one of the, one of the ones we lost and it made it much more difficult for me to understand how that could have happened because Roger's a squirt away firefighter mm -hmm. and a great human being. He's not a bad apple. Yeah. He wasn't and never will be a bad apple in my eye. And, and so how did that happen? to a good apple. I, and then sometimes you find yourself when people back then, maybe even to this day, when we do a South Canyon staff ride, get a little pointy on, well, what were they really doing down there? Mm. There's, there's no values at risk. What were they doing trying to say, well, that gamble oak and this and this? Like, whoa, whoa. You know, it puts me on the defensive because mm -hmm. I lost a bro there. Mm -hmm. So that gets to your, whether it's theory or concept of the, you know, the, whether it's bullseye or how close you are. Mm -hmm. If you know someone, it's a lot harder to, Put them in that basket. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you worked with somebody on the district and and you you're both you're on different engines, same district, 
and you work together every day and maybe even you switch trucks here and there and whatever and you know these folks right yeah um you got your engine set up the same and um and it's just you know and um on your day off there's a there's a fire the other truck rolls and those folks don't come back um you're gonna you're gonna have a it's gonna be much harder for you to say well it's just bad firefighters it's just bad bad operators right um and the further you are away from it you know that same engine that doesn't come back if you're on the other side of the country and you have zero connection to them it's really easy to write them off as bad firefighters yep um because and the, the concentric rings the, the proximity to or away from the center of that incident yeah and your your emotional tie and your ability to see um you know to have any sort of compassion for for the the dynamic situation that it that it had to have been yeah um and i think a lot of people experience that when it when it's somebody close to them that um, gets in a bad spot. Um, and it's just, and, and so what I'm, what I think we're trying to do with this is, is use that same concept, but at this grand scale, right? right? We all, here's Paul Gleason, the one, the, <laughs> the name, the personality that we feel like we all know. Um, it's really hard to put him in the bad apple, um, category. Don't we have like some kind of Paul Gleason award or yeah, something exactly. like that, even after his name. And I actually think that there's there's multiple firefighters today that um, that is almost the only way they know Paul Gleason from the is the Paul, leadership award. The, yeah, Paul Gleason lead by example award. Yep. Um, that's quite possible if you've been in fire for the last three, five, seven, yeah, ten years. That that, that might be the extent of, of how you really understand that. Well, even that, if you use LCES every time you go in a fire, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, um, and you know whatever. That's just that's that's not bad or good. No, that's just that's just how things go. But um, yeah, that whole um, proximity and 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 so it's trying to. I think we're trying to move people in because what happens is when something bad happens to those close to us, we we approach the learning from such a different perspective. We're like, oh man, I really need to know. I need to know. I need to figure this out because it doesn't make sense how Roger could end up in that spot. It doesn't make sense how my, you know, my, um, sister engine could, could end up in this spot. It doesn't make sense. I have to study it. I have to figure it out. There's got to be something, you know what I mean? What a different approach how it's like you're thirsty for learning at mm. that point yeah you got to figure it out yeah um and you want to know all the nuances and 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 you're trying to make sense of it given these competing notions mm, you know mm, that engine captain that i that i knew that i worked with every day she was amazing she was a good firefighter and she didn't come home how do i make sense of those mm. because my previous uh, understanding is if you don't come home, you're a bad firefighter. Right. And even if we don't say that, that's a lot of times what we use, um, or, or it's the, it's the default. It's the, it's kind of the old mantra. If you fall, if you follow the rules, everyone comes home. Yeah. Somebody died, somebody did something wrong. So if you, if you, if you do everything right, you always come home. Yeah. Somebody, you know, our lessons are written in blood. All of that stuff kind yeah. of leads towards somebody died. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody got hurt. Somebody did something wrong. Right. Um, and, and so, but that approach is what we're trying to get is, is when you know somebody and that inquisitiveness and that I got to make sense of this. I got to make sense of this. So, so what were they actually seeing when they were headed, headed down? And you, you're much, able, much more able to put yourself in their shoes because you knew them. And that's what we're trying to get at is, is because that's where the learning happens. You know, and we've seen it on staff rides multiple Absolutely. times where by the time we, you know, they get to the end and people are you know, sometimes like – on the verge of freaking out, just like, this could have been me. This could have been me. Yep. This, I, like, I, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. That's an uncomfortable place to end up. Yeah. Um, when your I, job is to do it. Yeah, exactly. And we've seen it happen on, on, uh, just about every staff ride I've had, not with every student, but I've definitely had people walk away from Cerro Grande, both as a burn boss, people going, I don't want to be a burn boss mm -mm. and agency administrators going, 
I don't know if I really if I want to be an agency administrator or Esperanza. Yeah. People walking away going, I would have been right there. I would have been right there with them. And I and this morning I thought there was no way in hell I would be there. What the hell are Forest Service engines doing, you know, halfway down a hill with fire below them protecting some structure? Right. What the hell? That's not what we get paid to do. That's not our business. And by the end of the day, they're just like. I would have been here. Yeah. And um, they died. Yeah. And we definitely see it at South Canyon with crews every year. Yep. Yep. I would have been, I would have been right behind, you know, the tool in front of me because mm-hmm. that's what I do yep. as I follow the tool in front of me and I I put the tool down in the dirt where they tell me to put the tool down. Mm-hmm. Um, and even leaders going, yeah, I could, I could see you making that call. Defaulting to the bad apple theory gets in the way of that kind of learning. And I'm not saying that that kind of realization is the, the measure of all learning. I'm just saying it's, it shows the power of a shifting perspective. Because right. all of a sudden now, all these pieces, I feel like it's like looking at it through a, you know, the paper towel tube, mm. looking at the incident through the paper towel tube and you go there and you hear from people and all that stuff. And now all of a sudden, like the paper towel tube is gone and your vision is as, <laughs> as wide as it can get. There's, yeah. you, there's no bounds in you because you're just like, wow, um, that's the kind of approach we want just for learning. I think the default is when you're not close to the incident, you don't know anyone there like we're talking about. You, you look for the, 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 the normal thing to do is look for the bad apples. Pick them out. Oh, look, there was two. There was three bad apples, not one. I'm done. And like you said, and we want to reiterate, you don't learn any lessons. There are no, no lessons to extract other than don't be a bad apple. Make good decisions all the time. Yeah. 100% of the time. Yeah. You don't want to get hit by a tree? Don't make bad cuts. Right. Super simple. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get sprayed in the face with fuel. Don't open it. <laughs> Don't open the fuel cap. <laughs> open it slowly. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. And and it's just I know we hit it time and time again from different angles, um, but I just feel like that that uh, Paul Gleason at Cerro Grande is is one way to kind of check that that bad apple. What if the burn boss I see three at Cerro Grande wasn't Paul Gleason? Oh yeah. What Super if it easy. was Firefighter X? Oh, easy. Easy answer, right? Yeah. Super bad, rotten, that stinky apple. Yeah. And then then, knucklehead, clown. Yep. And then the learning stopped there. And I wonder with many folks, because it was Paul Gleason, and it's much, much, much more difficult for those that know of him or his reputation or what he's done for all of us to put him in that bad apple basket. I wonder if there was a little bit more learning because it was Paul Gleason, because people maybe were a little bit more willing. That would be so Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Right? That's so Gleason. Yeah. (laughs) And he's like... (laughs) Right. He's like, oh, I know how we can make people students of fire. Watch this. (laughs) Not not intentionally, but just, you know what I mean? Just like the grace or the the kind of, you know, the, the, the way things went with with him and I didn't even know him, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's true. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great um, perspective to put on it. For more on this bad apple discussion, as well as a personal account of the Cerro Grande fire we just talked about, be sure to check out the spring 2018 issue of two more chains. Find it at wildfirelessons.net. Also, check out our blog at wildfirelessons.wordpress.com for a few great pieces on Paul Gleason and one more on bad apples. After the last podcast, we asked folks for postcards. Thanks very much to Nicole for our very first. No, it's not a beach in Hawaii. It's the Sapphire Pool, a thermal spring in Yellowstone. Thanks very much, Nicole. Finally, thanks a ton for your time. Recently, Travis was asked to provide some input for the NWCG course S211, Portable Pumps and Water Use. Travis had one critical observation. Humans aren't Mark 3s, and a collection of humans certainly aren't Mark 3s. <laughs> How do you like them apples, huh? <laughs>